Okay, good uh, morning to everybody in the UK, good evening to everybody in the Philippines. Uh, my name is Chris Nelson, I'm the Executive Chairman of the British Chamber here. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, very pleased to welcome you to this uh, webinar on setting up business in the Philippines. We're very pleased to welcome back Angeli, uh, a guest from the Board of Investments. He also presented before, but we also have another person with us. So what we're going to do, actually, we'll have uh, Domingo Bagaporo, who will, is the Director for Investment Assistance Service. He will take us through the first section. Then he will be followed by his colleague, Helen Casco, who is a specialist in senior investments. She will also obviously follow up. What we want this to be is obviously to have as many questions as you can possibly have. So please feed in your questions and we'll take them after the presentations. Without further ado, once again, thank you very much on behalf of the British Chamber of the Philippines. I'll now like to hand you over to Domingo Bagapora, who will take you through the presentation. Thank you, sir. Nice. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, please be uh, in Manila and uh, it's uh, morning in uh, London. And at this point, we'd like to thank uh, the British Chamber of Commerce uh, and the Philippines for inviting us, especially Chris, his uh, colleagues. So, uh, as Chris said, we are uh, going to be presenting a uh, uh, setting up a business in the Philippines and uh, with me is my uh, senior staff, Ms. Helen, to do the uh, 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 continuing presentation. Okay, uh, basically, maybe as a background, we would like to give you uh, what is the board investment all about, uh, what is this agency. The uh, BY or the board investment, we are a Korean attached agency of our Department of Trade and Industry, BDDI, and uh, the DOI is the lead government agency responsible for the promotion of investment in the entire country. So, uh, as the lead promoter agency, uh, we are tasked to boost the investment in the industries and the countryside, so the focus really is on the countryside, aiming to create both jobs and, of course, uh, uh, economic activity and uh, plus economic development of the entire country. And uh, with that, the DOI provides assistance to both Filipino and uh, the passes of foreign investors to set up business in the uh, country uh, of the desirable economic uh, activities. Meaning we have a list of activity priority areas, investment priorities, but this is the uh, economic activities that uh, we can engage in too. Okay, uh, just to show you also that uh, the BY, we want to upgrade our services, so that's uh, why we uh, applied for an ISO certification of our process, meaning this uh, ISO certification 9001-2008 got services. And basically, the functions are, we start from industrial development, which is the basis of the uh, uh, listing of the investment priorities plan. We do, of course, investment promotions. This is one of our core functions. We do investment counseling for the prospective investors, like uh, see, uh, you as a prospective investor who are counseling. We do project registration, which is actually a regulatory function of the board of investments. Registration of projects for purposes of incentives. And of course, those of incentives have to comply with some of the portfolio requirements. And last but not least, is we do aftercare services, meaning we provide assistance once you set up in the Philippines, we provide continued assistance to the companies that were registered. And of course, down below, these are just some of the uh, some of the functions is to support activity. But what uh, we are saying now is, gentlemen, the whole process of the DOI is ISO certified. Okay, the details of this, this is the basis of registration, basis of entry into the country. It will be discussed by my, uh, one of my uh, reliable investment uh, specialists, senior one, 
that will do the presentation. These are not only the details uh, of the presentation. Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to be here. Okay. To proceed, we go now to the Foreign Investments Act of 1991 or the Republic Act number 1742. This law is the basic law that governs foreign investments, developments, meaning that it liberalized the entry of foreign investors up to 100% foreign ownership, provided that it is not restricted in the Constitution and other special laws as enumerated in the FINL. So we have now as a reference currently the 10th regular foreign investment negative list. So it consists of list A, foreign ownership is limited by the mandate of the Constitution, specific law. Foreign ownership for list B is limited for reasons of security, defense, risk to health and morals, and protection of small and medium scale enterprises. So we have here list A, which means for 100% Filipino, when we say 100% Filipino, this this kind of practice or profession or activity or projects are for Filipinos. So I'll mention a few must be the except recording, practice of professions, retail trade, uh, with PIDA capital below 2.5 million US dollars, corporate cooperatives, private, private security indigences, small scale mining, and others. To continue, for the 100% Filipino ownership, ownership operation on management of cockpits, manufacture of park workers, and other paratechnics devices. We would like also to note that uh, this, uh, the next activity is 0%, whether Filipino or foreign, manufacture, repair, stockpiling, and or distribution of nuclear weapons, Manufacture, repair, stockpiling, and or distribution of biological, chemical, radiological weapons, and anti personnel weapons. Next activity, um, where there is a foreign equity of 20%, as you can see in the slide, private radio communications network. All right, 25% foreign equity private recruitment, contracts for the construction or repair of locally funded projects, 30% advertising. Now we go to the 40% maximum foreign equity. Can you see your slides? From 1 to 10, so these are the projects or activities which has a foreign equity of 40% maximum ownership. And the next, for the lending companies, financing companies, investment houses, so there is already a law that 100% uh, foreign equity is allowed. Again, to continue with the 60% Filipino, 40% foreign equity, slides 1 up to 7, as you can see in your monitor. So these are the activities which uh, can own maximum 40% foreign equity. We have examples of business activities allowed up to 100% foreign ownership, meaning if your activity or if your project is not listed in the foreign investment negative list, then a foreign company, a foreign individual, or a foreign investor can own a business in the Philippines in 100% ownership. Example, export enterprise, manufacturing assembly, wholesale and for trading, retail trading, retail trading, with a minimum paid up capital of 2.5 million US dollars. 
hotel, resort, travel agency, business process management, international credit forwarding, lending, financing, and holding companies. So these are examples of business activities allowed up to 100% foreign ownership, insurance, shipping agency, consultancy services. All right. We'll proceed now to the options for entry. When we say options for entry, these are the basic or these are actually the different business structures that you can do business in the Philippines. I'm sure you all, all know about sole proprietorship, meaning only one person is the owner of the company. A foreigner, as I stated earlier, can also be a sole proprietor, provided that the activity is not listed in the foreign investment negative list. As I have already shown to you the uh, activities up to 100%, so it could be a sole proprietor. Of course, there are requirements for a, foreign, for a foreigner for you to be able to apply for a business registration. Can you see your slides? Partnership. Partnership meaning you and I can be partners in business. So there are two kinds of partnership. General partnership, limited partnership. So this kind of uh, business shall be registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Unlike for the sole proprietor, you will have to register it with the Department of Trade and Industry. Corporation. I think this is a very familiar um, business structure in the Philippines. Corporation, at least five incorporators up to 15. So for a corporation, it may be a stock corporation or non-stock corporation. So for a corporation with a 40% foreign equity, it is considered as a Filipino corporation. If more than 40%, or starting 41% foreign on, it is considered as foreign on corporation. So this kind of business structure, you have to register with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Domestic subsidiary. I may have your attention please because this is uh, intended for a foreign owned company, meaning a corporation with more than 40% foreign owned and organized under Philippine laws. When we say domestic subsidiary, 51% must be owned by the parent company. So uh, whether it's a domestic uh, enterprise or an export enterprise, you can do this uh, kind of activity as a subsidiary. Later, we'll be explaining to you about the ownership or the paid-up capital, which is 200000 or less for those that will involve activity with advanced technology or company that employs at least 50 direct employees. Again, registration must be with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Representative office. These are office which are or intended or a foreign company wants just to promote their products in the Philippines. This is a non-earning company. This is not just a liaison office for promotion. This will not drive income in the Philippines. So they are required of a minimum inward remittance of thirty thousand US dollars to cover operating expenses. Again, it shall be registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission. These are examples of foreign banks with representative office in the Philippines. Can you see your slides? All right, we proceed to the branch office. When we say branch office, it's a business entity licensed to do business in the Philippines. It's just an extension of legal and juridical personality of the foreign head office, which carries business and activities of the head office for as long as the activity is not listed in the foreign investment negative list, the current company, for instance, uh, can 
have a branch office in the Philippines. The same requirement for the 200,000 US dollars for those that will cater to the domestic market and uh, for export, the 200,000 US dollars is not required, but you have to export at least 60%. The registration shall be also with the Securities and Exchange Commission. All right, this kind of uh, this kind of business structure cannot be registered with the Board of Investments for purposes of availment of incentives, but this can be registered with the Philippine Economic Zone Authority for those activities that is for export, including services. Regional headquarters. When we say regional headquarters, it's a foreign business entity form organized and existing under the laws other than those in the Philippines. So if you establish an RSP for sure, it's only for the purpose of administrative branch for multinational companies which are engaged in international trade. And this will only serve the branches, subsidiaries, and affiliates of the parent company. Inward remittance is 50,000 US dollars annually to cover the operating expenses. So again, registration should be with the Securities and Exchange Commission upon endorsement of the board of investments. Examples of the regional headquarters in the Philippines. Let's time this see your slides. Regional operating headquarters. The other one is regional headquarters. Now we go to the regional operating headquarters. This is also a foreign business entity form organized and existing under the laws other than those in the Philippines. So they can establish an ROHQ for short to service their affiliates, subsidiaries, or branches in the Philippines or in the Asia Pacific region and other foreign markets. The ROHQ will be allowed to derive income by performing the following qualifying services. As you can see here, there is a general administration and planning, business planning and coordination, sourcing procurement of raw materials and components, corporate finance advisory services, so on and so forth. So for the inward remittance for this kind of uh, headquarters is 200,000 US dollars, but it's only one time. So again, mandatory registration with the Securities and Exchange Commission upon endorsement of the Board of Investments. These are examples of the regional operating headquarters in the Philippines. So we have here from Asia, Europe, and America. Can you see your slide? Now we go to business process. When we say business process, there is this mandatory registration, business permit, other licenses. Internal Revenue, the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation. So these are among the mandatory registration when you put up business in the Philippines. Mandatory. Local government units. For instance, your, your office is located on a certain uh, municipality or city like Makati, Quezon City. So you have to register with the respective local government units. It's Barangay and City Halls. Barangay is a small locality within the city. So we have also other licenses and permits depending on 
what kind of uh, activity you will have to put up in the Philippines. So if you are going to have a transport, so we have this um, LTFRB. So we have also the Department of Labor and Employment. This is this is where you are going to to submit all the names of your employees, including those the foreign nationals. We have also the Banco Central ng Pilipinas or the Central Bank of the Philippines. This is where you will register your inward remittance. Once you the remit for the money, it should be uh, registered with the Central Bank of the Philippines in order for you to be able to repatriate these uh, investments that you are putting in the Philippines. So uh, on the last side, th this is this there is this optional registration of incentives. Meaning if a company wants to avail of the incentives of the government through our investment promotion agencies, they can proceed with the board of investments. Board of investment is where they belong. So if you register with the board of investments for a certain project that is uh, qualified to be registered under the investment priorities plan or IPP for this year 2017. So for instance, BPO, manufacturing, transport, hotel, for tourism, so they are qualified to register with the BOI. We have also one investment promotion agency, the Philippine Economic Zone Authority. This also registers foreign-owned companies that qualifies, but the, the activity should be for export, meaning export to manufacturing, export services. We have also other investment promotion agencies. As in the next slide, so we have a authority of Reportary of Bataan, Aurora, uh, the Peace Conversion and Development Authority, Government Electric Zone Authority, Economic Zone Authority, Clark Development Corporation, Chandney Management, depending, it's actually around the Philippines, we have investment promotion agencies. So should you want to register your project with incentives, you can proceed to your the, any of the investment promotion agency which you want to locate. These are economic zones, so if you are under the Philippine Economic Zone mm -hmm. Authority, you will be located at the economic zone that are uh, under the PESA, we call that. So, so Wanga, the reset, and uh, you can see your slide, so it's too big. So these are the investment promotion agencies with a total of 18 which gives uh, incentives to uh, foreign investors which are qualified to do business in the Philippines. So with that, I say thank you again and mabuhay uh, tayo Okay. Bye. Sort of cumbersome with these earphones, but we need it actually, even as they're so sensitive. So, hello everyone. Uh, that actually is the end of the presentation. We don't need it. Uh, that's the end of the presentation, apparently. Um, we have been asking for your questions. Uh, I don't know if you can any questions, but we are waiting. No? Um, so in the meantime, while we're waiting for questions, I have that. While we're waiting for questions to be sent to us, so while we're waiting for the questions to come in, let us, we have some questions here. Uh, I think the first thing that we want to ask, I don't know how we're going to do this, because obviously I've got the headphones. Um, I think what we're going to ask you, first of all, actually, on the negative investment list, right, which you obviously went through, and for all the companies that are dialed in, that's uh, obviously a, a, a keen interest. And obviously the word negative is, first of all, something <laughs> that people like to avoid when we talk about investment. You want to talk about positive, positive investment. I think what we'd like to hear from you is what are the possibilities, uh, and we appreciate this is not definitive, but what are the possibilities that some of those 
percentages to be reduced, what sectors could be focused on, and maybe that would give some thought to the people listening that, okay, those sectors are going to be more flexible. Can I kindly hand over? I hope that question is clear to everybody. So it's how can the current uh, percentages be mended, and is there any particular segment that could be focused on initially, because obviously that would give us some focus. Do I need to hand this over? Yes. This is not going to work very well, people. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Chris, for that uh, question. Uh, as regards to the, uh, 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 please correct, I think the past tense, but uh, at any rate, we have already delivered the list of meaning. Those are the areas which, uh, to some extent, restrict the entry of our investment. Chris mentioned about, Chris mentioned about uh, uh, possibly of uh, using the, uh, the list, the list, but uh, yes, that's possible. You know, the title is 10 for investment negatively, so there uh, was nine, and of course there will be 11 negatively, so meaning every two years we review this list. And definitely the uh, uh, idea really is to reduce this list, so that foreign investment or foreign uh, investors will come in uh, those areas. So uh, the, the process really is we review this within two years. There is a law which covers that, so the list is uh, being reviewed. Okay, so the, as I said, the, the tendency is to reduce that. So if you have, uh, say, uh, an idea or uh, an asset that you want to reduce, including the foreign ownership, I think there's no uh, uh, prohibition. You can request on areas that you want to uh, list, maybe, and that will be evaluated by uh, an inter interagency committee uh, led by our uh, national economic uh, planning body, which is National Economic Development Authority. As I said, this is an interagency. We can always look at the uh, request or consideration of any request by any company, by any individual. So this is reviewed every two years. So there will definitely, there will be an 11 foreign investment negative list, and you can uh, uh, they consider any of Okay, thank you, Domingo. Hopefully in the future we'll actually become the positive investment list. Um, and I think we'll ask you some questions uh, about specific sectors. I think that's actually important. Uh, before I come on, we have a question actually from Charles Hardy. Uh, Charles has asked, can I set up a business in Mindanao with a one stop shop approach with the Mindanao Development Authority. So would either Helen or Domingo like to answer that question, please? Okay, yeah. Uh, Mindanao Development Authority itself is uh, already uh, is an agency, another agency. This is actually looking at the development of Mindanao. And I think Mindanao, that, that agency, uh, they have a, a one-stop uh, one center, that's an agency created in Mindanao uh, Island that caters really to the investors in Mindanao. So I think they can, they will also, they will assist you, or process your application, assist you with any government agencies to, uh, to speed out your application. So uh, actually, uh, when we say one stop shop at the national level, we used to have that before, but at BUI, we are actually virtual. With the advent of technology, no need to house all agencies in one room. But we can easily coordinate with them at any point in time, any time, to, uh, to uh, process your applications. So the link with them, we have the IP unit, we call IP unit, we're in the link with these agencies. You have problem with any government agencies, we can easily link with them. Okay, so I guess just so for Charles Hardy, I guess the answer is yes. yes. Um, so Charles, yes, you can do a one-stop shopping approach or a setup with the Mindanao Authority. Coming back on the question, because I'm sure obviously with the different companies we have here, uh, I'd like to come to a specific sector, if I may. Uh, we at the British Chamber have helped over a thousand companies with inquiry over the last three years. And we've had a lot of inquiries on food and beverage. Uh, and that's been promoted by the Great Campaign. So what I'd like to ask you is, um, do you believe it's difficult to set up uh, a food and beverage? 
uh, what's their possibilities they can do because I know there was a kind of link to retail um, but we have seen a lot of interest in British food and beverage and we'd like to obviously see that further expand and obviously any assistance or advice you can give would be most appreciated by the audience. We really stand a retailing business so it would be under the Retail Trade Liberalization Act, sir. So with that, we will have to have a minimum paid up capital of 2.5 million US dollars for you to be able to put up a retailing store in the Philippines, even for a 100% foreign-owned company. Those are just one of the requirements. Another, there should be at least five branches among the world uh, and uh, around the world. And the other uh, paper requirements, you will have a letter of intent to the Board of Investments that you're going to put up a retail, retailing business in the Philippines together with the requirements, sir. Okay, well that's a very good answer from Helen. Um, what I'd also like to, to know actually, uh, and continuing obviously the focus on investments, if I'm a, a new company and obviously uh, business outsourcing is a, a major sector in the Philippines. Um, could you just a uh, give us some opinion on how that's been developing, and if there are any incentives for any companies who now may wish to come and obviously look at that area? Again, Ida, please. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Chris. The uh, BP or the business processing outsourcing sector is a priority uh, uh, sectors of the government. Actually, it's listed in our. Uh, investment this right. plan. So it's a priority. So obviously, if it is, uh, you come in and register with uh, the uh, uh, Board of Investment or any uh, investment promotion in this case, it will be entitled to the uh, fiscal and non-fiscal incentives. So uh, yes, it's a priority sector. We are providing incentive assistance to all types of business processing, uh, outsourcing activity, like okay. contact centers. So we have, uh, uh, some of the incentives we can send this to you uh, in the next of them, but uh, we have this and then this kind of Okay, uh, this is a question obviously uh, on behalf of the Chamber actually. We tended to obviously deal with small to medium sized enterprises. As you can appreciate, one of their single biggest questions is if I wish to set up a business, assuming it's not on your negative investment yes. list, uh, how long is it going to take me? Either in days or hours or minutes. <laughs> That's a tough question. But yeah. uh, yeah. actually, then, sir, we're setting up a business, assuming that the requirements is uh, complete. So we can take it as a one day with the Department of Trade and Industry, our sole proprietor. Then for the Securities and Exchange Commission, they can also do that in one day, provided that all the requirements are complete. We know that we have just a problem there if the the as to the requirements if they are not complete so the investor has to complete it so I, I guess that leaves the obvious question yes. are the requirements here more burdensome than in other places and can we be doing something to improve that because what we want to do is obviously attract people to this market of over 110 million people yes. right within a growing economy so I just want to know if there are steps yeah. to improve even those we we actually have uh, steps, especially for the Securities and Exchange Commission. Okay. Because, uh, as you know, for the domestic market, they have this requirement of 200,000 paid up capital. Mm -hmm. So, just to facilitate the business registration process, the treasurer of the company will have to certify that indeed there is a 200,000 US dollars of the company, so they could proceed with the uh, process of the business registration. Yeah, basically the invitation to that. Uh, as far as the documentary requirements you mentioned about workers, um, for instance, uh, well, well uh, that's why uh, each agency is now required to be transparent. Just okay. to list all the requirements so that no addition, no subtraction. All the requirements, as long as you comply with that, although it's still follow, but as long as you comply, we will process it. But the idea now is whatever you submit to that particular agency, the same document, should be submitted to the you just the same documents. No other documents to be submitted, no new documents, as long as you comply with the checklist of requirements. 
It's transparent now, yes. We still have a lot of documents to be submitted. Okay. As far as we said, comply with it. So the good news is for all you people listening in is that there are continuing efforts to reduce, uh, to speed up the process. And as noted uh, by Domingo and obviously confirmed by Helen is that now the use is to get like whatever the document is, those documents should be standard across the various organizations. Therefore, it does prevents people having to produce different documents for different agencies, which is an improvement. And the market of the uh, uh, government, the president, uh, is really to streamline, 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 streamline. Even the local government, they are mandated to streamline, streamline all the processes. We have these five steps, three signatories, used to be uh, so many signatories, so many steps, but they are reducing local government to are mandated to reduce their process. Which is very good. Now, if I, um, if you could come back, uh, and if I can just, come back, I think obviously you're from the Board of Investments. Um, if you had to look at sectors, if I may say now, and I know this is general, but I think it's good for the companies to know, based on your experience, where have you seen companies, notwithstanding any restrictions, start to look in terms of investing? Is there any different segments that you would highlight to the audience? Obviously, I brought up food and beverage. Um, I can just tell you from the British uh, China side, we've had companies that have been interested in environmental work yeah. that have set up business here. We've had pharmaceutical companies. So I just wanted to go from your experience, maybe there's any sectors you'd like to mention. So that would obviously give interest to potentially to our audience. Okay. Manufacturing in general is a priority. We have been very uh, liberal about all types of manufacturing activity, uh, from uh, equipment, power is another one especially renewable uh, energy. We are actually another priority for the government. And infrastructure, of course. Okay. okay. We are open up all infrastructure projects. We have even this uh, PPP, this uh, private public partnership project with the government encourage private companies to take that uh, area. It's a big uh, area for investments. So uh, we are encouraging can I just uh, take it on there, and there's two areas that I think would be useful to just highlight. One is in terms of renewable energy, uh, because I know the UK is actually quite a leader in renewable energies. Uh, within the, renew the renewable energy sector, is there any particular one you would focus on? Is it solar, is it wind, is it geothermal? And the other one I'd just like if you can just Infrastructure obviously is quite a wide word. If you could kindly give some more detail of what infrastructure projects, if you could name a few that the government are kind of looking at, which would then allow companies to start thinking. So there's two questions, yeah. renewable and infrastructure. As far as renewable energy is concerned, we are actually uh, encouraging more on the solar, uh, solar projects. And of course, biomass is an important uh. one. Uh, also, uh, in the areas of uh, wind, wind they're encouraging uh, also, and uh, hydro, well, a little bit, but uh, we have some limitation because uh, most of the projects are already in hydro uh, sector. So, so, well, as I said, uh, the areas which are uh, encouraging. As far as the infrastructure project is concerned, we have this uh, uh, build projects. Uh, toll roads, highways, ports, seaports, are encouraging investment in this area. Because, as you know, as Philippines is uh, an archipelago, so we need more on the uh, port and uh, seaport operation, the road projects, so we need those infrastructure. So, for our audience, uh, for those of you not so familiar, the Philippines is 7,107 islands. Uh, they say that's at high tide and low tide, many more. <laughs> uh, the key thing is the Philippines is green growing at a growth rate of about 6.5%. And obviously, that's actually to some extent inhibited by the fact that the infrastructure, if it was in a better place, could actually accelerate that growth even more. That's what uh, Domingo is referring to. I have a specific question, if I may just bring it to either you or Helen. This is from Salia 
just to Sharif, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, what is the minimum capital investment required for a service base on 100% owned foreign software consultancy company? So I'll just repeat the question. What is the minimum capital investment required for a service based on 100% owned foreign software consultancy so company? For consultancy services, doing meaning doing in the domestic market, the inward remittance or the paid up capital is at least 400,000 US dollars, or you register your business with the Securities Exchange Commission or a corporation or with a DTI, an inward return of $20,000. Okay, so for Salia, I get uh, the minimum capital requirement or investment is 200000 US dollars. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so, coming back on uh, what we want to see actually, uh, and just a little bit more, if I may ask, on, on infrastructure and aspects. Um, some of those projects are covered in the investment list, right? Yes. However, obviously these projects are going to be very large, whether it's building of bridges, roads, seaports, airports, and I assume there's going to be a lot of subcontracts and other companies. In those areas, so for example, if we are developing a, a regional airport, which is one of the, the aims of the government, uh, if you want to supply software to that, I assume to say for either the running of that airport or the security side, that's not covered in the investment list, is that correct? Because you'll be a subcontractor to the main contract. Okay, the, the, the one that will be uh, provided with the benefits of the uh is it is really the, uh, the main performance. The subcontractors, what, uh, the owner of the company doing the, uh, the uh, infrastructure project, the subcontractor will be, uh, will not be uh, given the, they are just doing part of the job. Sure, but they will not be covered by restrictions either. So they can supply yeah. there because they will be considered obviously, they're not the ones who are hosting main yeah. things. Supply equipment from police or just Okay. Well that's very clear. I, I just like to conclude because I have a short few words to say as well. So first of all, thank you very much. I just want to take you through uh, first of all I'd like to say a warm thank you. If the, if the audience can stay online, I just have a few slides to also show you. I hope it's gonna work. No, it's not working. So bear with us one second. Okay, very quickly. Uh, first of all, thank you again for all the people who've dialed in, and thank you again, obviously, to the, uh, our colleagues here, because it is a team effort from the Board of Investment. So once again, thank you to Domingo, who's been a very good guest before, and also Helen. I'd like to talk to you very quickly about the British Chamber. We are the overseas partner delivery, and we provide a number of services. Those services include market introductions, market research and intelligence. Actually, very critically, we do introductions on business to business and business to government coordination. We also do bespoke services. We do trade investment missions, technology and product launches. These are some of the companies that we have assisted through those chargeable services. A company called PayWizard. Gurak or Jantus, this was our start. We have many, many more. Uh, so I'll just show you the different logos so you can see how it's starting to develop. And as you can see, in 1617, that further expanded. I'd also like to highlight to you our various events. Uh, I appreciate those of you in the UK will unfortunately probably not be able to visit us for the World Gin Day. It's a great event. Uh, however, we will have another webinar on the 30th of June where we focus in particular on the foreign investment negative list. We're going to get that word negative out one day. It's going to be positive <laughs> investment because I think that's what we want to achieve. 
And of course, we'll also be doing a business lunch and dialogue with Reza and the Board of Investment. And we intend to have a lot more webinars. And in addition, we have an aid mission which will be coming out in October. Finally, I'd like to tell you that you need to contact us if you have further questions or anything you'd like to know. Obviously, please contact Rona Diaz, who is our project manager, and on the screen is all the details which you can get. Finally, I'd like to wish all of you, obviously, a very good evening in London and everywhere in the UK. And I'd like to thank our partner here today, which is UK ABC, for kindly hosting this platform. And we intend to have a lot more webinars, and we appreciate the interest you have shown. Have a great evening or day in the UK. And from us in the Philippines, we wish you a very good evening. Thank you very much. It's been highly appreciated. I'm Chris Nelson from the British Chamber. Thank you. Thank you. Nice.